Hello everyone and welcome to session 4 of the uh, theoretical discussion on uh, remote sensing applications in engineering geology. So in this lesson we are going to just cover the principles, essential principles of different procedures of remote sensing that are normally used in uh, different applications, uh, particularly uh, geologic mapping uh, that we considered in the last session. Okay. But before we proceed with the uh, discussion, subject matter of this particular lesson, we are going to uh, discuss the questions that I asked in the previous presentation. Uh, the first question that I asked was what is meant by the term outcrop. Outcrop is essentially uh, a, it essentially is a body of bedrock that is exposed at ground surface. Then the second question that I asked was that what are the different types of contacts between geologic units. We discussed this one in great detail in one of the previous presentations and the types of contacts that we considered in that at that time were uh, conformal contact, non-conformal contact and one of the types of conformal contacts uh, was uh, considered, was we discussed a type of contact uh, called gradational contact. So these are the three different types of contacts we discussed earlier. Now contacts can also be classified uh, depending on whether the contact is through uh, the plane of a fault or not. So the, con so the contact could also be classified as a fault contact or depositional contact depending on whether or not contacts between two different geologic units is across the plane of a fault uh, or through a deposit, uh, surface of deposition. The third question that I asked was how would a sandstone layer appear on a geologic map of a deeper of a deep river canyon if the layer dips at 75 degree in the down river direction. Now recall uh, from what we discussed in the previous presentation, previous uh, classroom presentation was that uh, when there is a dipping layer going across a valley then the outcrop of that particular layer takes the shape of a V or an U. So this is the outcrop of the layer seen on the plan, uh, plan view that means when we are looking at this particular map uh, uh, upside down. Uh, from 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 an elevation looking down now this is the outcrop of the geologic unit that we are looking at now in this case though and 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 the and the reason why the outcrop actually takes a shape of an u or a v inside the valley is because near the valley bottom, bottom at the point where the outcrop is at the lowest level, lowest elevation that is going to proceed in the down deep direction. So at this location the outcrop elevation is the lowest compared to the elevation of the outcrop at uh, the, uh, at the flanks of the of the V shape uh, that is the reason why the tip of the V always shows points towards the down dip direction irrespective of, uh, of the surface topography within the valley. So the valley could be could either slope in this direction or this is the valley, this could be the valley slope or the valley slope 
could be the other way around. Irrespective of the direction in which the valley slopes, the down dip is going to point, uh, the, the down dip direction is going to be pointing towards the sharp corner of the V if you have got a dipping uh, layer crossing a particular valley. So, in this case though, the dipping, the dip angle is quite uh, near vertical. So, you may not get a pronounced V shape as shown on that particular figure, but what you might get is a shape like this. So, this is the valley or canyon that we are considering or canyon and the shape of the outcrop may look somewhat like this. And again this is going to be the direction of dip of that particular layer. So, that takes care of all the problems that I asked in the previous presentation. So, with that said I am going to proceed with the subject matter of this lesson. So, what we are going to discuss here, we are going to discuss essential principles of engineering of, uh, of remote sensing applications in engineering geology. Uh, we are going to consider the procedural details, essential details of the procedures of several different types of remote sensing like aerial photogrammetry, uh, LIDAR uh, and IFSAR we are going to discuss in this lesson and we are going to we are going to try to develop a notion of how to use these remote sensing procedures in simple problems of geologic mapping. Okay. Now, preliminary concepts of engineering, we begin with the preliminary concepts of engineering uh, of remote sensing application in engineering geology. We first of all need to understand what we mean by remote sensing. Remote sensing essentially means uh, uh, deriving information about the characteristics of a of a geologic deposit without any physical contact uh, with the deposit. For example, if we take a photograph of a particular uh, geologic deposit and get, derive some of the characteristics of the uh, deposit that are of interest in from engineering standpoint then that kind of investigation is going to be known as remote sensing. Then remote sensing the principle principally remote sensing uh, remote sensing relies on the reflectance characteristics of different surface materials over various portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now typically uh, not only visible light is considered, but infrared near and far infrared are utilized in, in trying to get the reflectance characteristics of different materials. We are going to see how different materials behave in these different regions of electromagnetic spectrum. Microwave is also used in remote sensing. Thirdly, we typically require multispectral coverage to derive useful information about different uh, geologic units. Then remote sensing procedures that we are going to consider in this lesson may or may not uh, may, may or may not use its own energy and depending on whether or not it uses its own energy, the remote sensing procedure is classified as active or passive with the active remote sensing procedures are essentially uh, they, they require their own energy source whereas passive remote sensing procedures require uh, no energy source. They purely uh, depend on the reflectance uh, reflected uh, 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 electromagnetic waves uh, that bounce off of uh, bounce off of those uh, of, of different geologic units. The origin, the, those, uh, those electromagnetic waves might originate from 
sources other than the source specifically dedicated for the uh, remote sensing investigation. Now, let us understand why we require why we require multispectral image. In other words, why information derived from a particular uh, wave band is not going to be sufficient in the uh, normal investigation procedure. What we are going to consider here is the reflectance characteristics of sand and clay and we are going to consider that there are different moisture contents within these deposits. So, in the vertical scale we are plotting the percent reflectance percent reflected and in the horizontal scale we are plotting the wavelength in micrometer. Now, typically and and let us let us draw the scale as well. So, we are plotting in the vertical scale we are plotting from 0 to 100 percent and in the horizontal scale we are plotting from 0 0.5 micrometer to say 2.5 micrometer. Typically the reflectance characteristics of sand dry sand is going to take a shape like this. This value where it saturates is approximately approximately 60 to 70 percent. On the other hand, if you look at clay, clays are much less re reflective than sand and typically what you might get is a shape like that. So, this one is sand and the lower one is clay. Now, uh, this one is dry sand by the way, this one is dry sand and this one is clay with little moisture content. So, it is moist clay with moisture content of say 5 percent. Moisture content is typically defined as the volume of water to the volume of dry soil is the ratio of volume of water within a soil matrix to the volume of dry soil. Now, let us see what happens when we try to uh, saturate the sand that was originally dry. So, when we saturate the sand then what happens the sand may actually come down to have a reflectance characteristics sort of look like this. Now, you see these valleys these valleys are going to occur are expected to occur at 1.4 micrometer and 2.7 micrometer uh, actually 1.9 micrometer sorry 1.9 micrometer we are not plotting 2.7 So, this one is 1.9 micrometer. These valleys are indicative of presence of water. They are actually absorption, uh, they, they are absorption bands of water and they confirm the presence of water within the soil skeleton. Now, look at the similarity of the moist clay and saturated sand with a moisture content of say about about 8 percent moisture content. This one is moist sand. So, what I want you to look at is the remarkable similarity of the moist sand and moist clay over in this region of bandwidth 
from about 1.5 micrometer to about say 1.2 micrometer. So, they are largely similar. Now, if we do not consider the, the absorption, uh, the, the uh, reflectance characteristics beyond 1.2 micrometer, greater than 1.2 micrometer, we will not be able to distinguish whether we are looking at moist clay or moist sand for, uh, for uh, mo in most cases. Now, this kind of you can you can realize the importance then of covering a large range of wave bands of wavelengths in the reflect in the in the uh, in the remote sensing technique in order to distinguish between different types of geologic materials. Okay, getting back. Next, we are going to talk about we are going to talk about the reflectance. Let's let's explore what are the factors that the reflectance generally are influenced by. So you understand that reflectance depends on the geologic characteristics of the material that we are trying to identify. Then it also depends on other things like what is the what are the other constituents that might exist within that particular geologic body, geologic material. For instance, uh, the example that we just considered in that we had water as the other constituent that was present within the uh, body of sand and the body of clay. Now, you could also imagine that there could be other types of chemicals present in a geologic material. For instance, there could be there could be iron oxide that might be present within a surface soil layer. And depending on whether or not iron oxide is present, the reflectance signature is going to be quite different. And you can expect that uh, you, you, many of you might know that the color of iron oxide is red. So, the reflectance characteristics of a material of a geologic material containing iron oxide is going to be much richer in the red wave bands compared to an another material of very similar characteristics, but without iron oxide. Then the reflectance characteristics also is going to be affected by the organic content, the density of vegetation and type of vegetation that might grow on that particular geologic unit. What is the, what is the wavelength of radiation uh, which is considered in the in the reflectance signature. And again, we want to state as I stated in as I explained in the previous uh, sketch that I was drawing that we need to consider a wide range of wavelengths in order to distinguish different geologic materials because of the non-uniqueness that, uh, that, that are going to crop up because of different combinations of, of chemical constituents that might be present in a parent geologic body. Okay. Now, let us consider the type of type of I mean type of uh, uh, or, or the range of wavelengths that are normally exploited in existing platforms of remote sensing uh, satellites. This slide here actually shows the entire wave band of uh, of of uh, electromagnetic spectrum ranging from 10 to the power 12, 10 to the power minus 12 meter to 10 to the power 10 to the power 4 meter. Here, what we got. Uh, we actually as you all know that we begin from gamma radiation at the shortest range of the wavelength. Then we gradually transition from X rays to ultraviolet rays to uh, the vis visible spectrum, then infrared, microwave and eventually into radio waves. 
So, the spectrum that is normally exploited in remote sensing are uh, the visible spectrum, the visible light, near infrared, Uh, to some of the some of the remote sensing platform they also utilize the far infrared and there are quite a few satellites that exploit the microwave wave bands of the electromagnetic spectrum now you know from visible light we can distinguish different objects like we can we can see uh, whatever we can see out of a photograph we can also distinguish when we take a photograph from a satellite platform uh, in the visible wave band. Now, near infrared actually is the, uh, they are actually characteristics of different constituents of within the geologic unit. Like for example, uh, depending on what is the density of vegetation and uh, what, whether there is any water body present depending on those things, the reflectance characteristics in the near infrared are going to be different. We are going to discuss these things in greater detail uh, in the next little bit. Now, far infrared is essentially, uh, that essentially indicates what is the amount of heat that is coming out of a particular geologic body. And this information is also useful in some remote sensing techniques. But most of the satellites that we are going to, uh, we normally use, they cover the visible light and the near, near infrared signals. And out of these satellites, uh, common are Indian remote sensing satellites, then Landsat and the spot satellite of the European Space Agency. In the microwave band also there, there are useful information about geologic characteristics of materials and there is a satellite operated by uh, Canadian Space Agency, uh, it is called Radarsat uh, that generates useful information in the microwave wave band, in the, in the radar, uh, those are essentially radar imagery. Okay. Now, these, thi these platforms are essentially satellite platforms, they are, they actually uh, uh, go around in space and circle around the earth every so often. We are going to look at the characteristics of these satellites uh, later on. You could also think about similar multispectral imagery covering a large range of wave bands based on airborne systems other than satellites. Like for example, you could fly these remote sensing tools on aircrafts or even blimps and they are also used uh, in remote sensing techniques. Now, uh, airborne imagery is going to get, going to give you a very uh, high resolution pictures within these wave bands in comparison with the radar imagery, but the expense that is, a, that, is invo that is involved in carrying out a project specific airborne survey could be quite large and may not thus be possible to, undertake, to be undertaken in projects that are of comparatively smaller size. But in these projects, uh, satellite images could be purchased from the remote sensing agencies uh, that we, that, that I indicated in the previous uh, slide uh, and the, these satellite photographs also generate quite useful information, but to a much larger scale. Okay. Now, this, this slide actually summarizes the different, uh, the, the characteristics of different airborne, airborne uh, uh, different satellites that are used uh, uh, for getting remote sensing images. 
at the top is is the landsat thematic mapper you can see that the altitude of this particular satellite is about 705 kilometer then the bands that are obtained i mean different uh, uh, the, the bands that are obtained number of bands that are obtained from this uh, uh, platform uh, is 7 the swath width of this satellite is 185 kilometers and the spatial resolution of the satellite is 30 meters so in other words in one coverage this particular satellite is going to cover a width of 185 kilometer on the surface of the earth and you could distinguish two objects only if they are separated from each other by about 30 meters if you want to actually get a better resolution then this particular satellite the images obtained from this particular satellite may not be useful but you look at spot 4 satellite of the european space agency landsat is a satellite operated by nasa of the us uh, spot 4 satellite on the other hand it has got an altitude of 830 kilometers but it gives only uh, photographs in only four wave bands it has got a smaller swath radius of 60 kilometer and it has got a much better spatial resolution uh, which allows you to distinguish two objects that are separated from each other only by 20 kilometers you look at radar set actually indian remote sensing satellites it has got a larger altitude uh, it, it operates at nine, 900 kilometer above, above the earth earth surface and uh, it has got a it is it also covers four wave bands but it has got a larger swath weight than uh, spot 4 satellite of this one has got a swath weight of 147 kilometers and it has got a spatial resolution that is slightly poorer than the landsat thematic mapper imagery uh, radar sat on the other hand it has got it actually you might remember that radar sat obtains photograph in the uh, in the in the microwave band it has got a much better resolution and you could distinguish two objects even if they are uh, uh, as close as 3 meter from each other this one has got a swath width of less than 500 kilometer let me explain actually what i mean by the swath width this this different terminology that i used when i was talking about the satellite now consider a satellite consider a satellite that is operating at some elevation above the earth and this elevation depends on the platform that you are thinking of for example in case of IRS this elevation is about 900 kilometers so this is the surface of the earth this one is the surface of the earth and by swath width what I mean is that the remote sensing camera is going to look at a width A, a, a I mean it is going to cover a track on the surface of the earth as the satellite is actually rotating about above the earth so this one is the satellite track track this one here is the remote sensing satellite So, and this one here, this one, it is the field view of the sensor, of the remote sensor. Of the sensor or sensor array in general.
So, this width is called the swath width. So, that explains the, the terminology that we are using that we used in the last slide. Okay. So, now let us look at the, the kind of mapping capabilities that will be available on these different remote sensing platforms that we considered that we listed in the previous slide. Now, Landsat thematic mapper has got a temporal resolution of 16 days. What it means is that it covers the same portion on the surface of the earth once in every 16 days. So, if you take two images covering the same location on the surface of the earth, it is going to be apart from each other temporally in terms of time by 16 days. It has got a radiometric resolution of 8 bit. What it means is that uh, it, it has got a scale of reflectance that ranges from 0 to 2 to the power 8 minus 1. And the scale of images from Landsat uh, thematic mapper are typically 1 in 50,000. So, you cannot get a better resolution than 1 in 50,000. So, for instance, if you have got a large project in which you are going to be requiring a remote sensing image of 1 in 10,000 uh, or 1 in 5,000, then the thematic mapper images will not be enough, will not provide enough resolution that will be suitable in your project. So, in that situation, what you have to do? You have to develop your own, uh, uh, own uh, you have to actually develop your own uh, remote sensing program in order to cover your area of interest. Now, let us look at what are the corresponding temporal and radiometric resolutions for a spot 4 satellite. Uh, temporal resolution for a spot 4 satellite is 26 days. It has also got a radiometric resolution of 8 bit and the scale of the images is again 1 in 50,000. IRS satellites on the other hand, it has got a temporal resolution of 22 days. It circles the same, uh, circles the earth once in, uh, actually it covers the same location on the surface of the earth once in every 22 days. It has got a 7 bit radiometric resolution. That means, the brightest part on an IRS image is going to have a, uh, a uh, reflectance of uh, 2 to the power 7 minus 1. Uh, whereas, the darkest part on the image is going to have a radio, uh, have a value of 0. It has got a much poorer scale actually and the scale, the best scale that you can get out of an IRS image is 1 in 125,000. Radar sat again is going to give you uh, photograph, uh, going to give you remote sensed uh, images of 1 in 50,000 scale and it has got a temporal resolution of 24 days. All right. Now, let us consider a few examples of uh, Landsat thematic, a uh, few examples of multispectral remote sensing images. Now, we consider Landsat thematic mapper images uh, that are available from the NASA and we give the example, uh, example images of the same uh, covering the same area uh, in each different wave bands. You recall Landsat image are available, La Landsat images are available on seven different wavelengths, a range of wave wavelengths uh, and they are going to be shown one after another. Let us consider band 1. Band 1 covers wavelength of 0.45 to 0.52 micrometer and you can imagine you you you, you understand that that uh, band 1 is in the visible spectrum uh, and these images the 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 reflectance in band 1 
distinguish different types of soil and rock and also it distinguish cultural objects. By cultural objects we mean man-made objects like for example a large dam can be visible can be identified on band 1 of Landsat thematic mapper image. Then band 2 shown on the right of the slide there um, it, it, it is you, you, you realize that it covers the same location on the surface of the earth. Band 2 covers wavelengths from 0.52 micrometer to 0.6 micrometer and these at, at this wave band actually vegetation, cropland, uh, uh, cropland and clean water they appear as dark objects. So for instance in, in the image to the right this one this object is a water body. And as indicated, as indicated uh, here, as indicated here, it actually appears as a dark object in this particular uh, image. Now, if the water becomes turbid, the water, uh, the, the color of that particular water body becomes lighter. So, obviously, the water body that is shown at the middle of the left edge of this particular image is comprised of reasonably clean water. Okay, let us move on to band 3. Now, band 3 actually covers wave band between point between wavelengths 0 0.63 micrometer to 0 0.69 micrometer. So, you can you can see that gradually we are actually changing from the red end of the visible spectrum uh, actually to the from the from the blue end of the visible spectrum to the to the red end of the visible spectrum. Uh, band 3 is again in the visible spectrum but it is towards the red end of the visible spectrum. Again you can see that the water body that we considered and uh, we saw in the previous image that appears as a dark object here. So, this was uh, shown in the previous image as well and here again water and vegetation appears as dark objects and different types of soils they appear as light colored objects. So, this one here this feature here actually is a vegetated area around a stream that actually flows across this particular area. So, this one here is the stream and the vegetated area that I showed up there actually are forested land on the valley of the stream of this stream water water stream. This one is another vegetated area. So, that kind of tells you about what are the different types of characteristics reflectance characteristics in this particular wave, land, uh, wave, land, wave band that you might expect uh, for these images. Let us move on to the other bands. These bands are not in the visible spectrum and you can see the characteristic you can see the change in characteristics. This portion here this portion here you recall uh, was the land the vegetated area that we considered that we saw as dark object in band 3. So, this is actually vegetation 
vegetation whereas this was a, this was this this appeared as a dark area dark patch in the in band 3 whereas now this area is uh, is starting to appear as a bright image but the water body is still uh, showing up as a dark patch so here what we get vegetation cropland with crops moist soil and water they appear as dark objects now cropland without crops and dry soil they appear as as relatively uh, relatively light objects uh, then we move on to band 5 band 5 covers wavelengths between 1.55 to 1.75 micrometer here again forests appear as dark and urban area uh, cropland they appear as gray areas Move on, moving on to band 6 and band 7 you remember uh, landsat thematic mapper images they actually uh, they actually have got 7 band multispectral coverage so band 6 is shown on the left there and band 6 covers wavelengths between 1.04 to 1.25 micrometer and these are actually thermal infrared images so they show the heat reflected of of the different types of geologic units and band 7 shown on the right that covers wavelengths between 2.08 to 2.37 micrometer in this uh, in in this wave band actually water and forest they appear as dark objects whereas urban area cropland bare as well as without crop and highways they appear as light colored objects so you can see by the ref the reflectance characteristics of different objects they actually tend to differ from each other when you consider different ranges of uh, wavelengths in a multispectral image uh, for instance cropland on band 7 let's move back a little bit cropland in band 7 bare or with crop they will appear as light colored images in band 7 now if we go back to band 5 then all croplands they will be appearing as gray objects so by comparing band 5 and band 7 you could then say whether a particular cropland is going to be is, is actually vegetated at the time of the uh, at the time when the photographs were taken or not so this this kind of illustrates the use of multispectral remote sensed imagery in uh, trying to distinguish different geologic objects okay now these individual bands of photographs can be combined to give true color composite images or false color composite images the one that is shown on the left of this particular slide shows the true color composite image of the same area that we saw in the earlier bunch of uh, remote remote sensed uh, images here what we have are channels 3 2 and 1 and they are combined together in true colors you remember channel 3 was of red color channel 2 was uh, green and channel 1 was blue on the right is a fault color, false colored composite image and a false color composite image actually combines different objects uh, by assigning different colors uh, you, you, uh, different colors that are not exactly the same not exact that do not exactly match the wave band in which the particular image was obtained for example in the false color composite that is shown on the right in that channel 4 
was taken as red, channel 3 was taken as green and channel 2 was taken as blue image. And in this particular way of combining different images uh, show vegetated land as red as is apparent from this patch here. So, this one if you recall shows a, a vegetated area vegetation and that shows as a red color image on this particular this type of false color composite. Okay. Now, what are the applications of satellite remote sensing? Satellite remote sensing is uh, the, the major application of satellite remote sensing is in trying to assess terrain stability, whether there is any lands, whether there is any signature of existing landslide, landslide uh, features on the surface of the earth or whether there is any indication of ongoing slope movement. Now, ground movement estimation is also another uh, application of satellite remote sensing. For example, there are visible faults, fault scarps. If there are visible fault scarps on the surface of the earth, whether the fault, whether, whether the blocks on both sides of the fault is actually moving or not, that can also be uh, also be detected if we are looking at a very high resolution satellite remote sense uh, photograph. Uh, then we can look at geologic hazard identification. All these things can be combined in geologic hazard identification. We can assess whether landslide hazard is present in a particular area or there are earthquake hazards available, um, earthquake hazard exist in a particular area from uh, satellite remote sensing. The second procedure for remote sensing is actually aerial photogrammetry. In aerial photogrammetry, is a, it's essentially a passive procedure in which we look at what is the reflectance signature of the reflected uh, electromagnetic waves that bounce off from a source of light, for example, the sun, uh, and we take a photograph using those reflections uh, off of these objects. These imagery is typic are typically in the visible wavelengths, and we can use a mosaic of overlapping photographs taken from a taken from an aircraft uh, with a metric camera. Uh, we can we can overlap these photographs to form the topography. We can develop the topographic map of a particular uh, area by using mosaic uh, of overlapping photographs by using the principle of parallax. We can also derive planimetric information from these images. That means, we can, we can find what is the physical distance between an object A that appears on a particular photograph from object B, because we know exactly what is the photo scale, uh, because we know very precisely what are the uh, what are the features, what are the dimensions of a metric camera, and from what height the photograph was taken. Okay, the principles of aerial photogrammetry is illustrated on this slide. Uh, the overlapping pictures are obtained by having flights uh, running parallel to each other, as shown on the left photo uh, left, left sketch, so that the field view of these photographs overlap with each other. Usually, this is called the side lap, and side lap, usual side lap is typically 0.3 times the width of swath. The overlap in the direction of the flight is called forward lap. In this case, the overlap between two consecutive Im images is 0.6 times the swath width. Aerial photogrammetry also can be used to develop geologic information uh, from color, tone and texture of drainage pattern. Light colored materials actually, uh, actually appear as a, uh, as a lighter objects. 
topographic highs of, of appear as a lighter tone braided and meandering channels or low relief areas they actually appear as uh, as uh, as dark colored objects poorly drained areas also appear as dark colored objects drainage spacing uh, if another way actually you can you can uh, interpret aerial aerial photographic images is by looking at the physical physical spacing between drainage bodies. If the drainage bodies are uh, are closer to each other, uh, 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 closer to each other than 120 meter, then that indicates that one is in a clay terrain. If the distance, on the other hand, exceeds 800 meter, then one is actually in a sandy area. Now. Aerial photogrammetry has got a surveying quality that means we can distinguish different objects uh, as close as less than 1 meter from each other and this is widely used in terrain stability mapping. Okay. Now there are two other techniques commonly utilized in aerial in, in remote sensing they are called LIDAR, light detection and ranging, in which uh, what is done from a from an aircraft pulses of uh, of lasers, laser pulses are bounced off of different geologic images. And from the two way return time of the signal, one could develop the topography of a particular area as well as uh, the nature whether there is any vegetation cover or not uh, uh, from these two way return time of the laser pulses. Another procedure commonly used is called the IFSAR. IFSAR is, uh, image, is an imagery in the radar band like the radar sat image. Uh, this is also another active remote sensing procedure and here what is done is the, we use the interferometric principle to develop the topographic details of a particular area. And again both LIDAR and IPSAR they can be used to construct a bare earth model that means if there is a vegetation cover we can formulate a topographic information uh, of the surface of the earth that is underneath the vegetation cover. Okay. In order to, now we have actually more or less covered in a nutshell what are the different types of remote sensing techniques used in uh, engineering geology and how the information that are obtained from these different techniques are used in remote sensing uh, in, in, in different fields of engineering geology. We explained how satellite images are obtained, how the satellite images are interpreted, aerial photography, aerial, the principles of aerial photogrammetry, LIDAR and IFSAR, what are the uses of these procedures and we looked at the application, uh, essentially I mean very, very simple applications of these techniques in remote sensing, uh, uh, these techniques of remote sensing in engineering geology. We finally end this session with a question set that is shown on the slide there. Uh, I, asked, uh, to a, I asked you to explain what are the principles of a LIDAR survey, uh, which one amongst gravel, sand and clay is likely to show uh, the greatest reflectance in an aerial photograph. Then the third question is how would you identify the location of an old landslide feature from an aerial photograph. Uh, and finally, what is a false color composite in connection with satellite remote sensing multispectral image. These answers uh, will be provided when we meet again in the next session. So until then, 
uh, you try to answer these questions and I will see you again when we meet with the next session of this course. Thank you very much. Hello everyone and welcome back uh, to the classroom session 5 for the uh, video course on engineering geology. Today we are going to learn uh, different aspects of uh, physical properties of minerals uh, and we will try to identify different minerals based on uh, their different types of physical properties. We will try to list them and we will try to see how they differ. Uh, from mineral to mineral, but as is the practice, uh, we are going to answer. We are going to prepare the answers for the problems given in the previous presentation. So the question set that we had in the last presentation uh, are uh, went like this: explain the physical principle. Uh, explain the principles of lidar survey. Uh, let me explain with a sketch. So, what is done essentially is from an aircraft we emit radar actually lidar uh, uh, laser pulses and those pulses are made to bounce off of the topographic features. So, this is our aircraft and there is a laser source on board the aircraft and that emits pulses of laser signals and there is an onboard instrumentation system that actually picks up the uh, calculates the two way travel time of the laser pu pulse and it also keeps track of the positional attributes of the aircraft from those information uh, it actually computes the x y and z coordinate uh, or the the two horizontal and the one and the vertical coordinate of the point off of which the laser pulse was reflected now as the aircraft progresses forward, what is done is to emit a series of laser pulses in this pattern of an elliptic spiral and using information from each one of those pulses together with all the other information, all the other uh, two-way travel times for other pulses from the same area, 